Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Susan Murphy. The San Diego City Council today wrapped up its final meeting of a special committee on homelessness. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the work is continuing. The council established the Select Committee on Homelessness last year as a temporary forum to move forward new ideas on how to house more unsheltered San Diegans. Councilman Chris Ward has served as the committee's chairman. His district, which includes downtown, is by far the most impacted by street homelessness. He says he's looking forward to hearing more ideas from the new city council members being inaugurated next month, even if they don't always agree. A little bit of healthy tension can be a good thing. I think if we are complacent, then we can kind of stretch things out and, and, and not much will get done. Um, so we want to challenge each other, I think, to be able to do more uh, and do things faster. Ward says San Diego's high profile representatives in the state legislature put the city in a good position to compete for affordable housing dollars recently approved by California voters. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Hundreds more migrants, mostly from Honduras, arrived in Tijuana today, bringing the total so far to more than a thousand. The sight of so many people on the streets is triggering anger and fear among some Mexicans. KPBS border reporter Jean Guerrero says that tension is leading to occasional violence. The city of Tijuana turned a sports facility into a migrant shelter for members of the exodus, as most of them wait to apply for asylum in the U.S a process that can take weeks because of backlogs at the ports of entry. The improvised shelter can fit up to 2,000 people, but the city doesn't have enough tents or staff just yet. Long lines formed outside the facility. Allison Vallecio, a four-year-old from Honduras, was among those waiting to get into the shelter, along with her parents. She was very clear about her ultimate destination, to the north, to the United States. I north. After a few hours of waiting, the family got inside, where they have access to health checkups and bathrooms. Most of the other shelters are already overcrowded because of an influx of Mexicans fleeing violence in their own home states, like Michoacan and Guerrero. But even with the sports facility opening its doors, there isn't enough room for everyone in the caravan. Thousands more are still on their way. Earlier this week, hundreds set up camp in the upscale neighborhood of Playas de Tijuana. Videos on social media showed hundreds of Mexicans coming by throughout the night, telling the Central Americans to go home. They accused them of leaving trash and messing up the community. Violence broke out. Hugo Reynoso was there. Try to help my people. The next day, he spoke to one of the caravan migrants from Honduras apologizing for what happened and trying to explain. We have a bit of psychosis, a bit of fear, because we've suffered so much in the city. Reynoso says residents are worried because homicides are at an all-time high in the city, and they fear that the caravan is too rowdy. This is nothing about discrimination or races. It's nothing like that. It's, it's just to... Give, uh, we, tr we was trying to give our opinions to them and tell them to, you know, relax. The city sent buses to the neighborhood all day to transport migrants to the sports facility turned shelter. But it's unclear what's going to happen when hundreds more arrive. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Border officials say caravan migrants will have to wait in Mexico until they can be processed into the U.S. A Customs and Border Protection spokesperson said the ports of entry are at capacity. A statement provided to KPBS said CBP processes undocumented persons as expeditiously as possible without negating the agency's overall mission or compromising the safety of individuals within our custody. The statement also said no one was being denied the opportunity to seek asylum, but it did not provide a timeline for how long it would take for all migrants to be processed. The death toll from Northern California's campfire continues to climb. 56 people are now confirmed dead. Fire officials say at least 300 people are still reported missing. The area was largely a retirement community, and officials say many of those unaccounted for are 80 years or older. Improved fire 
Weather conditions today have allowed crews to gain ground against the massive fire. The White House announced today that President Trump will travel to California this weekend to meet with fire victims in northern and southern California. As fires rage across California, a team of San Diego nurses is heading north to help victims of the campfire. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says the group left today. This is Scripps Health's medical response team. This morning, five nurses geared up on a plane and left for Chico. They're going to help victims of the campfire, which has already killed at least 56 people. There's a whole lot of you know survivors that don't need to be in the hospital, don't need to go to the emergency room, but have medical issues. Cal Fire says there are over 5,000 firefighters trying to put out the campfire. Now California's Emergency Medical Services Authority, which is in charge of coordinating disaster medical response, is asking for help. In fact, what we heard from NEMSA yesterday is they were desperate for doctors and nurses to help, help come up and help support them in the shelters. These nurses won't be working in hospitals. Instead, they'll be staying in shelters with people directly affected by fires. Scripps has had a medical response team since 2001. We've been to uh, Hurricane Katrina, the Gulf after Katrina, Haiti. Uh, we were out in Rancho Bernardo during the wildfires in 2007 and Nepal in the last couple of years. So it's a very, very experienced team. Scripps says it was asked to deploy to Chico for up to two weeks. Staff say they are in the process of getting a second team together. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. As the San Diego County Registrar continues to tally the votes from last week's election, it appears there could be an unexpected political upset in North County. The latest vote count shows Escondido Mayor Sam Abed losing his seat to political newcomer Paul McNamara. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John says the blue wave is lapping at Escondido's shores. Mayor Abed was winning on election night, but as late votes are counted, his lead has disappeared, and Paul McNamara, a retired Marine colonel and a Democrat, has pulled ahead. Abed has served two terms and was expecting to serve a third. A pro-business Republican, he easily fended off a challenge from Democratic City Councilwoman Olga Diaz four years ago. In May, Abed was one of the San Diego officials who went to Washington, D.C. and sat next to President Trump, throwing his weight against California's sanctuary city laws. In the past, he supported measures that penalized landlords who housed undocumented immigrants. McNamara, on the other hand, has run on a platform of ending divisive politics. He says the city has lost its way, and he challenged Abed's narrative of successful business development in the city. McNamara says the council has wasted money on unnecessary lawsuits because of poor decision making. With a McNamara win, there would be a new progressive majority on the Escondido City Council. Latina Consuelo Martinez has defeated incumbent Republican Ed Gallo to represent District 1. McNamara and Martinez would likely vote with Olga Diaz, who has till now been the lone Democrat and therefore in the minority on most votes on the Escondido City Council. Martinez's win comes on her second attempt under the new district elections, begun four years ago, that were designed to increase diversity on the city council. From the KPBS North County Bureau, Allison St. John, KPBS News. San Diego County's regional planners could end years of debate and settle the uncertain future of the county's only coastal freshwater lagoon. The Buena Vista Lagoon between Oceanside and Carlsbad has been a point of friction for years, but Sandag appears close to a major decision. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson has details. San Diego County has several coastal lagoons, and in most, tidal ocean waters blend with freshwater draining out of the local watershed creating a saltwater habitat. But not the Buena Vista Lagoon. For decades, a man-made wall known as a weir has kept this coastal lagoon a body of fresh water. The concrete barrier sitting underwater right now keeps the lagoon water level at about five feet above the average ocean level. Joan Herskowitz of the Buena Vista Audubon Society says that closed system is causing trouble. The watershed that supplies fresh water also carries sediment, which is slowly choking the lagoon. Everyone has had an interest in enhancing the lagoon so that it doesn't become a dry meadow, doesn't fill in completely. Local residents value the inland body of water, but there's a long-running dispute between homeowners and conservationists about the future. The Audubon Society wants the concrete weir taken out. See, if the weir was removed and the ocean tides were allowed to move in, it would increase circulation, 
improve the water quality, and also bring in ocean fish. Uh, uh, these lagoons are nurseries for ocean fish, such as halibut, and uh, that would be an advantage. Herskowitz says the region has a rare chance to add to rapidly dwindling supplies of coastal salt wetlands. And allowing the ocean tides to flood the lagoon would get rid of another vexing problem. The lagoon is being squeezed by out-of-control cattails that are taking over the shoreline and shrinking the amount of open water. These cattails have filled in and they are breeding sites for mosquitoes. And the people who live around the lagoon have been plagued by mosquitoes. We get these people at our meetings getting slightly hysterical about how they can't sit out because of the mosquitoes. And it's easy to see why cattails are an issue. They are so tall that you can't see water or homes nearby. And if you look here, you see that at the base of these reeds is standing water. That's breeding ground for mosquitoes. Homeowner John Teneglia lives in a gated community near the mouth of the lagoon, and he's quick to criticize fish and wildlife officials for failing to maintain the lagoon for the past few decades. He says they should have cut out the cattails. If they had just done that periodically over many years, we wouldn't have the, you know, the incredible abundance of these cattails that populate like, like rabbits. And so from time to time, we, we clean up our, the cattails here just because we realize they grow and they're a menace and they choke things off. Now, under salt water, the cattails go away. Yes, I would agree with that. But under proper maintenance, the cattails can go away. Teneglia is among those who fought hard to keep this a freshwater lagoon. He doesn't share the confidence of local planners that opening the lagoon to the ocean would even work. They would widen this from 50 feet to 100 feet, rip out the weir and make this a complete tidal uh, flushing basin. And they would dewater the entire lagoons and then <clears throat> hope that it would matriculate over a number of years, but they've admitted there's no guarantee it will. And they've got things in the environmental impact report, the EIR, that states that they've got to monitor this and make changes as they go along. But they admit it's an experiment. The San Diego Association of Governments took over stewardship of the project in 2012 after the State Fish and Game Department couldn't broker a plan that worked for all the stakeholders. Sandak planners have painstakingly examined the lagoon and four potential solutions. Saltwater, freshwater, a hybrid solution, or doing nothing. It's a beautiful body of water. And we're now talking about <clears throat> changing that forever. So whatever we do today, our generations after us are going to have to live with that. So that's, that's, you know, that's a big deal. Sandag was poised to vote on the issue last January, but put off a decision to incorporate more public input in the environmental impact review. That document recommends moving forward with the saltwater lagoon option, and the board is expected to vote that plan up or down. The board may also discuss the Carlsbad City Council request this week to put off a decision for six more months to allow the parties to work out a compromise solution. It's unclear whether that issue will be voted on. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. If Sandeg approves the restoration effort, it is likely to take a number of years to complete. There's a bit of a setback for San Diego's newest pro sports team. The San Diego Seals will not kick off its inaugural season next month. The National Lacrosse League canceled the first two weeks of gameplay due to a labor dispute. They say it's within the players' union. So the team's first game in San Diego is set for January 12th. But that could all change if the labor dispute continues. Woodruff tonight on the news hour, the death toll from California's worst fire rises even higher as residents begin the long road to recovery. Coming up at 7 after evening edition on KPBS. Bone dry conditions continue in San Diego, but the Santa Ana winds have calmed down. Daji Azwad has details on some moisture in the forecast. Winds are subsiding here across the southwest, and that's great news, especially for all of the fire danger that we are seeing here across the region. As you head into our satellite and radar, you might notice we got some clouds off the coastline. This is an indication that we're getting a bit more moisture into the region, as well as a cooling uh, mechanism. 
As for our current dew point, still pretty dry out there, but we should see this enhance, increase as we head into your extended forecast. And 19 in LA, 16 for your dew point temperature in San Diego. And if you don't know what dew point is, it measures the amount of moisture in the air. And when we get below 60, well, it's just bone dry, especially out towards Reno with a dew point temperature currently of 9. Now, San Diego County tonight, we are cooling down into the 40s, lower 40s for Oceanside, Borrego Springs, low 45, and Mount Laguna cooling down to 37. Here in San Diego, mainly clear, but clouds going to start to edge on in. We could even see some fog as we continue into your extended forecast. We'll be cooling down to 55 here tonight, and as we continue into your Friday, well, there's that coastal cooling, and that's where we're going to notice a bit more moisture uh, in towards California. Now, inland, still going to be dry, but notice the winds are definitely lighter than what we have been dealing with over the past week or so. San Diego County's forecast for tomorrow, allowing for some sunshine in towards Borrego Springs, the high of 79, 58 in Mount Laguna, and topping off at 72 in Oceanside, as well as in towards San Diego. This weekend, any plans? We will be feeling warm here across the southwest region, but not looking at any signs of wet weather, unfortunately. But the good news once again is those winds are easing on down. Now, as we head through your Friday night here across the coast, you will be noticing more chances for low clouds Saturday morning as well as that fog, and that's going to be the trend here for the next several days with temperatures in the lower 70s through your Monday. Uh, we'll be feeling uh, feeling temperatures remaining uh, in the upper 70s here across the inland areas, but also noticing low clouds and fog. As for the mountains, going to still need those jackets in the upper 50s for your highs, cooling down into the upper 30s. Deserts, 70 78 on your Saturday with partly sunny skies and remaining in the upper 70s through your early week. Reporting for KBBS News, I'm your meteorologist, Dodgy Swat. Back to you. Usually, this is the time of year when the Grinch takes over at the Old Globe. But this season, the Balboa Park Theater is staging a second Christmas show, this one with a military theme. KBBS arts reporter Nina Guerin tells us about the world's premiere musical by country music star Clint Black called Looking for Christmas. The Old Globe is a theater associated with names like Shakespeare, Sondheim, Seuss, and more and more these days, Steve Martin. Talk about me, I, I'm fine with that. <laughs> but for its latest show, Looking for Christmas, the Globe went outside its trusted roster of writers to produce a musical by Clint Black. Yes, that Clint Black. The best-selling country music star known for songs like Killin' Time and A Better Man. That's quite an unlikely pairing, one Black even acknowledges. So the question remains, does Clint Black even like musicals? You know, I really loved him except for all the singing and dancing. And, uh, <laughs> you know, my, uh, my real experience with musicals has been in movies. And, uh, and some of them I really love and, and get hooked on and can watch again and again and again. And some of them don't resonate with me. And I think that's true with, with uh, every piece from every genre. And, uh, and so, you know, it wasn't some strange thing that people could be talking and suddenly break into song. I'd seen Elvis do it plenty of times. For his own musical, Black and co-writer James Sasser based the story on songs from Black's 1995 holiday album, Looking for Christmas. The show is about Mike Randolph, a staff sergeant who returns home from Afghanistan only to have trouble readjusting to civilian life. Instead of enjoying friends and family, he's haunted by memories of the battlefield. It's Mike's nine-year-old daughter who helps him find the true meaning of Christmas. In 2004, I reissued my Christmas collection with two new songs with the album title Christmas With You, which was one of the songs, one of the new ones. And uh, it's a song that uh, my lead guitarist and I wrote right at the beginning of the war in Afghanistan. And it was right at Christmas time, and we were thinking about all those families who were going to be apart. And so we really based our backstory for the purposes of writing the song on the military families. Black presented early versions of the show in New York. And when the Old Globe showed interest in staging it, the idea of bringing the musical to a military town like San Diego felt like the right fit. I played on the USS Kitty Hawk here 
and uh, know I pl played at Camp Pendleton. I know that that uh, you know there's a huge uh, community, uh, military, and their families here. So. It just felt perfect. It's also a chance for the Old Globe to expand its audience. Through donors, the Globe is giving free tickets to military families. Because Looking for Christmas has never been staged before, it's been a round-the-clock effort for Black and the creative team. With the show now in previews, there are new revisions and changes every day. It's uh, really requiring a lot of patience and uh, self-control because I'm used to getting it right and then putting it in front of an audience and in this business you get it as right as you can and then you put it in front of an audience so you can get it righter and that's a, <laughs> to, uh, take some adjusting for my brain. Looking for Christmas isn't over after its run at the Globe. The show is set for a national tour and Black hopes that it's able to spread what he thinks is the true message of Christmas. The message that uh, I found when I wrote the album uh, and titled the first one, Looking for Christmas, it's what I was doing. I had to learn and relearn all the things about Christmas that I knew or didn't know and where the traditions came from and uh, try to find the, the true meaning of Christmas. It's not, you know, and all the toys and stuff, right? It's uh, uh, looking around and thinking about what other people need and trying to give that to them. And I think that's a year-round message. For KPBS Arts, I'm Nina Guerin. In 1968, Steve McQueen famously drove a Ford Mustang through the streets of San Francisco. It's arguably one of the best car chases ever put on film. Well, that iconic car is in San Diego with KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando, who joins us from the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Hello, Beth. Hi, I'm here at the Speed Exhibit, and what better thing to have here than the 50th anniversary of Bullet, and to have the Bullet car here in San Diego. I'm here with the owner of that car, Sean Kiernan, and Sean, this car was considered like missing in action and lost for a number of years, but it was sitting in your family garage? Yeah, absolutely. It's been in our family for 44 years, and uh, yeah, my whole life. I don't know my garage without it, uh, so having it here in its first museum, uh, it's, a, it's kind of bittersweet. It's amazing to have it here. This is obviously an amazing place to be, uh, especially with the ties with Ford and everything. So for me, it's, it, it kind of ties in with everything and uh, just makes it that much easier. Now, your parents actually drove this car around. Absolutely, yeah. So this is uh, their daily driver. This is our family car. There wasn't a uh, uh, like this and something else. So yeah, this is my mom's daily driver through the week, and uh, my dad kind of did the non-mom driving on the weekend. So he uh, he, he kind of used it for what it was for on the weekend, and mom did her daily driving in it to uh, to school. She's a uh, she's retired now, but she's a uh, third grade school teacher. So you didn't reveal to the rest of the world that this was the bullet car until earlier this year? Yeah, absolutely no one knew. Uh, people in my family and close uh, relatives and that's it. And then uh, two years ago, being inspired through uh, quite a few people uh, that are close to me, uh, I built it and we collectively uh, kind of focused towards January 14th of this year, which actually happened to be her, uh, she was 50 years old in six days. So. Uh, she was built here. Uh, she was built in San Jose uh, on January 8th, 1968, and absolutely no one knew. Uh, and somehow uh, we were able to keep it secret to the day of. And I talked to you about the engine in this car. So this is mostly the original engine still? Yeah, so car front to back. Uh, the only thing that, you know, is replaced because it had to be replaced and just for safety reasons. So my goal, and honestly it was my father's goal too, but my goal when I started this whole thing was to make sure that she looks the same, original, uh, didn't disrupt history. She would start, stop, not catch on fire. That was the focus of this. And uh, I tried to do the, you know, it justice as far as I could because who am I to disrupt history? And uh, yeah, I just, it's a timeline of my life and I never wanted to disrupt that. I always wanted to make it look, feel, smell just like it was when I was a kid. And that's all I had to just, that's, that, that was my goal. And I, I feel like I've done that. And with everybody's reception of it and respect, uh, I feel like they're extremely happy that I, I did that, so. 
And just to finish up, why do you think this car chase in Bullet was so iconic and has stayed in people's memories so long? Oh, it's just like the car. So the car itself, if you see it, it's one of a kind. And the chase was one of a kind. And it's raw and it's real. And that's exactly what this car is all about. And that's the way it'll always be. All right, well, thank you very much. We are here at the space, Air and Space Museum with the 50th anniversary of the Bullet car. Thank you, Beth. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, a new season of Narcos debuts on Netflix, where the Mexican state is the perpetrator and not the victim. And on Midday Edition, taking a look at the life and legacy of a music champion in San Diego, that's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.